Well, what would you do if you could only have one block between, right? Between competitions. Well, look, that's more difficult. So today we're going to be covering a pretty interesting topic. Um, it kind of relates to powerlifting, if you haven't guessed. Maybe you just clicked on this uh, podcast for the giggles. God, I'm off to a terrible start. So today is all about short prep times in powerlifting. Like, what do you do? Because typically, to summarize, what we'll do in powerlifting is we'll do like two to three blocks of, let's say, hypertrophy work. Then we'll do two to three blocks of strength work. Then we'll do a peak, and then we'll either test our maxes or we peaked for a competition. That's generally how we do things in powerlifting. Uh, but like, what if you do if you don't have such an extensive off season, or not even so that, like, what do you do in the situation of, like, three to four weeks, six weeks before another competition? Maybe you're even competing back-to-back. That's what we're going to be covering today. But before we do, I have a very cool announcement. The website is now officially live for Fit Big Strong. So if you want to check it out, maybe apply for some coaching while you're there, uh, head over to fitbigstrong.com. Uh, yes, that's it's very, very exciting for me. I am... It took a lot of work and it took a lot of unproductive work because I have to spend so much time just learning about website design and because like why the hell would I pay somebody to do it when I could do it and take 10 times as long and save possibly less money. Yeah, so that was the announcement and let's actually get onto the content of today. So before you actually make any decisions into how we're going to periodize over however long we need to periodize for, It's important that we have some information covered. And so this is really fundamentally about understanding the timelines, understanding your body, understanding kind of like different scenarios, etc. surrounding that kind of knowledge and understanding the goals as well. So let's say you're competing and you have three comps lined up and they're very short prep times. Plan the purpose of each comp. And what I mean by this is... Maybe it's like state qualifier, states, nationals, right? And they're really, really close together. Well, the goal is to win nationals, or maybe it's to break a record at nationals. And really for the first comp, it might just be to qualify. And the second comp, it might just be like to place, or even again, just to qualify, right? And so what is it that we need to be doing? So for example, to qualify generally, to go from a state qualifier to the states, it's very easy. Oftentimes, like if you're a sub junior, all you need to do is just like compete. It's very, very, very low requirements. And that's good because that means that you don't potentially need to be peaking for these kind of competitions. Are you going to peak when all you need to do is show up? It's like you might as well just have like a fun day with the friends. You might even help out some other, other your competitors there who are your friends. And so you kind of have more of a step back approach to this competition. Like, you could be hitting like just like your volume, like let's say you hit like a set of eight, right? And that's actually, and like your sets of eights are actually the numbers, like the total of those as singles is enough to qualify. You could literally just hit up, like you could literally just hit like a warm up, right? On the platform and then qualify for states. And so it's important to understand what is actually the purpose of each one of these competitions so that we can make the best decision. It might be able to buy yourself some more preparation time if you don't peak, for example. And then let's say the stakes are a little bit higher for states, right? Like it's very possible that qualifying for nationals, there's a much higher gradient of what you actually need to be doing. And so you might be phasic in the sense of performing a strength block during that phase. And that way, again, you're avoiding the necessity to peak, but you're also ensuring that you're lifting enough. So it's important to plan what each competition is for. And maybe you want to peak for your first competition. Who knows? The point is, is to plan and also to understand the times between these comps. Because if it might be like state qualifier states, it might be six weeks. And then you might have 12 weeks for nationals. It's like, that's potentially a very different plan you literally might be able to do volume and then do like one strength block 
and then basically just keep building strength. Who knows, right? Like it all depends on the time lengths and you, you can't make any decisions possible if you don't have the data. You haven't kind of written down what you need to write down. And so keep that in mind as well. And also everybody is different in the sense of how long they necessarily peak for, how long they perform strength blocks for, even how long they perform volume for. Usually, people peak for a uh, less of a time than they peak, or no, not necessarily, they peak for let's say three to four weeks, but they might do a strength block for like five to six weeks. And so, just as an example, like obviously it depends on who you are as a lifter, but like, if you're trying to fit in like a strength block before you peak, do you even have the time frame, or can you extend the strength block and take away from the peak block, for example, right? Like write down if you're a coach or even if you're an athlete yourself, write down the general uh, mesocycle lengths that suit you best and the ranges. So for example, like generally the lowest will go for like a peak is like three weeks, right? What's the longest will go for like a volume block, you know? And just write down all those kind of details and then you can start comparing and making adjustments. You know that maybe your practical range for strength blocks is three to five weeks, right? And so, or even another strategy you could do is you could accumulate for let's say four weeks on a strength block, do a half week deload, and then maybe push it for like another two weeks, These are all situations that you can think about. So you can extend the strength block just by a week so that your time frames actually match up. And then it's like, it's the worst when you're trying to figure out a prep, right? And you've got nationals and you're about eight weeks out. But if you were to do your typical peak and then like strength and peak taper, you'll be off like by like a week or something or even like one and a half weeks. And you're like, shit, what are you going to do? Well, what you can do is you can, t- let's say, cut a week off your strength block, do a half-week deload, and then push for another two weeks. And you kind of just buy yourself enough fatigue reduction so that you can fill in the slot. This is all decisions that you can make, but you just need to understand what your ranges are for when you peak. Is it three to five weeks? Is it only two weeks? I don't know, right? Like, it all depends on you. And I, I can't answer those for you, really. And also, one thing to think about as well is find the recovery times of your lifts. Because it doesn't matter if you can peak for three weeks. If you can only do deadlifts once, like heavy deadlifts once every nine days, it's still going to throw off your cycle. Like, how the hell are you going to time your SRA curves for your competition, right? These are all things you need to be considering. It isn't just like weeks and days. Because you might be able to hit like a heavy bench, well, heavy for you bench, four to, eight, four to five days out from competition, but you know you might need to pull back on deadlifts. And so then when do you start deadlifting? After competition, when do you start deadlifting? So also write down your general recovery times for like a heavy session and maybe even like a moderate session. And if you're not sure what I'm talking about, I did an episode where I discuss SRA curves. I believe it was in powerlifting periodization. Uh, It was an old, old episode. You'll have to scroll pretty far. But if you're confused, then definitely check out that episode. But like, those are important considerations because you might be able to, you might not be able to use a certain configuration because you need to emphasize deadlifts. And if you, let's say, do that half deload cut scenario, your SRA curves won't match up with your taper for deadlifts and then you mess up on comp. So these are all things you need to be thinking about as well. So now that we are armed with the information that we need, what are some trade-offs and considerations when we are planning our competition timelines under these unfortunate circumstances? Because in reality, we really do want to be prepping for like a long time, but maybe it's like, you know, in maybe we didn't hit certain numbers on a comp, and so we need to try and qualify in another competition you know, or so to speak, or like we need to quit or all of a sudden we need to jump into a competition, you know, for whatever reason, it doesn't matter, right? You know, I know that in Australia at the moment, well, previously when I say in the moment, I mean like a month ago, two months ago, uh, my coach, he had to do like a nationals or like a, a states really quickly to qualify for worlds. 
and then you flew over to Worlds after like two to three weeks. And so like, what would someone do, right? Well, let's kind of discuss the different volume blocks and kind of how they compare under certain conditions, right? What do I even mean by that really quickly? Well, if you've got an eight-week timeline and you have room for two blocks, you know, either a strength, a hypertrophy, or a peak, right? Like, like what is it that you're going to do? Well, you don't want to go from like volume to peak because you kind of like reverse the adaptations with a volume block compared to what you want to be training for a peak. A volume block, the central nervous system is sending short bursts more frequently. And when you peak, you're sending a large burst of force, but only for one time. Those are completely different adaptations, right? And you're also, like, that's just, you're kind of like, if you did a strength block, or you just came off a competition, right? You just peaked for that competition, and you go on a volume block, you're almost like detraining, you know, what you just did in your peak, right? Because now you're trying to focus on building muscle and work capacity, which you totally should if you had a long off season, right? But we don't have a long off season. And so it's probably best to be doing like a strength block in that scenario. Well, what would you do if you could only have one block between, right? Between competitions. Well, look, that's more difficult. It also depends on what you just did before your previous comp. Was the goal of that competition, did you peak for that competition? Did you not peak for that competition, right? Because if you didn't peak, then you can do a peak. But if you didn't, it's like, what are you going to do? Because, you know, you've got the concerns of injury risk, you know, going back to back peaks and there's also diminishing returns. You know, I think it's probably best to be doing kind of like a peak slash strength hybrid. But saying that, if you're try- if this is a major competition you're going into, you want to be doing a straight up peak. So make sure that the competition beforehand, you are either doing like a like a mildish kind of peak where it's like a strength block with singles and doubles or you're just stretch just a straight strength block and then you know you taper off let's say on the last week of accumulation for a half week you know you hit the numbers you need to hit to qualify and then you move on to your major competition after comp like after competition basically taking that whole period to deload moving into your peak tapering and then performing that's probably the best strategy in that scenario but it all depends right and so the the length of period the length and period of time really does determine what it is that you're actually going to do if you had 12 weeks you might be able to run two strength blocks one that's more general higher volume you know more specific strength block and then run into a peak you know, like that's something you can totally do. We can even run, you know, let's say two strength blocks, which are very specific, right? Like that's something you can do and that's totally fine. But I've, I am highly against running volume to peak. You know, I just think that's a terrible idea. Peak to volume, you know, obviously after competition, that's kind of what we want to do because we need to rebuild that work capacity and start building some productive muscle tissue. But volume to peak is just terrible, right? And so I really, really just avoid that in your decisions. If your coach is like, you know what, we can do three weeks of volume before we go back into competing in two weeks. It's like, no, fire that man very quickly and go to fitbigstrong.com and apply for coaching. (laughs) Haha, you see what I did there? Honestly, I don't think many strength coaches are that unintelligent to run a volume and then do like two weeks of peaking. It's okay. I know that was a joke. And you know it was a joke too because you're also, also intelligent. Uh, See what I did there? I'm buttering you up. Okay, let's actually focus on this. Okay, what about competitions where it's weekend to weekend? What are we going to do? Right? Like you just competed on Sunday. You go, fuck, I got to compete again next Sunday. It's like, this is rough. Like if you're in this situation, like something's happened, right? And so, you obviously don't have time for anything. And honestly, like, you'll be so fatigued from the last competition if you push that competition. Like, if you didn't push that competition at all, you just kind of, like, showed up and, like, 
maybe that was like the start of your taper. And so you just tested openers on at that competition. Dude, don't even worry. Like just follow a normal taper. But assuming you had to go hard at that previous competition, like what do you do, right? I think it obviously applies. Don't, the goal is in this situation to maintain strength. The goal is to maintain strength. You're not going to be able to build anything. So don't be trying to accumulate a bunch of fatigue. I think after competition, maybe take one or two days off, right? Assess your recovery curves to see how heavy you can be going, you know? And so, you know, maybe it takes five days to recover from a super heavy squat. Maybe you just hit like a single at six with like three by two back downs, maybe like a 10 to 12% drop, right? Like a single at six is like, you know, you recover in time and you'll potentially be quite fresh, right? So, I would probably be hitting something like an SPD day uh, as an option or even like a squat deadlift and then maybe bench throughout the week. Or actually, you, you could even hit like a squat bench, deadlift, and then a very moderate squat and then a moderate bench. And then that's kind of like it. That's one thing you can do. You know, it all depends on also your recovery curves. You might be able to hit an RP 9, 10 single on bench with a bunch of back downs and then hit like a light bench, right? It all depends on how weak you are. And so it's important to understand these kind of phases. But even though like recovery times matter, it's also systemic fatigue. That's why I said like, we're not going to be wanting to build strength. We just want to maintain. What is the volume that we can perform at a high intensity so that we maintain our strength, but not add fatigue, right? Or you potentially reduce fatigue because we're at a maintenance state. Keep that in mind as well. But generally, you probably only want to be hitting like one or two heavy singles on the main compounds if you're competing back to back. And I would also be very proactive in getting like remedial massage and talking to physiotherapists and just kind of nail out as many of those nagging little, you know, things that pop up as we compete. Because like, you you, you know, you might find your, your back will just be, or your legs will just be super fried after competition so you know might be, might help to go get a mer, 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 oh okay i can't say this word i'm having a stroke remedial oh i did it i'm not having a stroke let's count my abcs i'm just joking <laughs> hey how you doing this is ashton having a stroke now ashton is going to go back to talking about powerlifting because why is he doing a random segue when you're interested in powerlifting? So yeah, like as to just to summarize in this weekend to weekend situation, probably best to only hit one to two singles, heavy singles for each S, like for each lift. Um, and you don't want to be pushing yourself hard, get massages and relax as much as you possibly can because you will be carrying fatigue from that competition. Expect to lose that fatigue depending on how hard you went after like four to five days. And so you really don't want to be pushing it too hard, okay? It's very important. Because I usually, after competitions, I actually just take like a week off training completely. It's almost like an active rest phase, right? I've just done like a week of active rest on my taper, and now I'm doing another week of active rest. So it's almost like it actually potentiates gains, potentially. Um, But that's for another episode on active rest phases, which are very useful, by the way. And just to quickly summarize so that you don't feel uninformed, an active rest phase basically resensitizes your muscle fibers and uh, to growth again. uh, Because when we train, especially when we push high volume training, our muscle fibers convert from fast twitch to slow twitch over time. And slow twitch fibers are less prone to growth. And so if we uh, basically just like train really low volume we can resensitize these muscle fibers. But then again, as powerlifters, on our peaks, we train low volume and we're training quite heavy. And so we're potentially just resensitizing muscle fibers anyway. It's all situation dependent, but that's a whole nother episode which I I should cover. Okay, so now we've kind of understood how we're going to phase our training depending on the situation. And to quickly summarize, anything above 12 weeks, we can follow more of like a traditional approach Anything below like six, eight weeks, we want to be careful about not, uh, we want to be careful about including volume blocks. Generally, it's a bad idea. Anything below four weeks, we want to be making sure that the comp previously 
we were hopefully doing a strength block uh, and we hopefully weren't peaking because that way then we can truly peak and get the best peak possible for this next competition. The concerns with going peak to peak is uh, law of diminishing returns. We actually might get more total strength output if we spent another four weeks building strength as opposed to test, test, right? Diminishing returns comes very quickly. And so that's an imp- that's another reason, again, why we phase our training. So that's the kind of the summary. And from weekend to weekend, we probably only want to be hitting a couple singles, very light, and then moving again back into the competition. So the programming considerations un- in this environment, general versus specific strength. So just to summarize these terms, on competition day, squatting a single for a one rep max is the most specific we can possibly lift. General is like doing safety bar squats for sets of 10, right? It's further away from the actual competition lift. And so there's obviously benefits to training very general. Uh, You know, we build strength in different ranges of motion and we can even target specific ranges uh, to be more difficult or to be easier so we can train positions. Um, And that can and does have strength carryover if used correctly. But if we are trying to get maximum performance for a competition, we can take away from those specific adaptations. Why would we train a safety bar squat before competition, like on our peak, compared to uh, when on competition we are trying to squat the most weight possible? right? And we're not going to be doing safety bar in competition. We're probably going to be doing low bar, like barely to depth, right? And so those, um, you know, like should we be using general strength? Well, again, let's go back to the premise of when do we, inc- uh, before, right? If we've got over 12 weeks, we, we could potentially be incorporating some more general movements as well. And you've also got the benefit of like, we're not constantly taxing the tissues in the same way if we use variation. And so it might actually lower our injury risk and make us stronger for the competition if we use some more general strength, let's say at about 12 weeks out, right? So we go block, 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 that third block away from competition, we might want to incorporate some more general strength. You know, it could even, you know, it doesn't even have to be like, it's like super, super far general as well. Like if we squat low bar, we might squat high bar right? Or we might do feet elevated squats. So we emphasize the quadriceps. So it doesn't need to be like super far away in regards to like the specificity curve, but you know, it it doesn't need to be super, but we don't want it to be very specific. If that makes sense. If we are to incorporate it less than eight weeks, you kind of want to be focusing more on specific strength. You know, if you've got eight weeks, You know, if you've got a nagging injury, it's not going to hurt if you, let's say, did pause squats, like long pause squats, let's say, to lower the total load and manage an injury, you know, as an example, you know, it's probably okay if you brought the grip in a little bit on bench press, you know, like these are all, you know, it's okay to do that, right? Like I've got an athlete now and he's seven weeks out from nationals and we're doing pause deadlifts right? And he's only like just transitioned to normal sumos. He's been doing pause deadlifts for basically his entire prep previously. I haven't got him touching a single like normal sumo rep because it's okay, right? Like the goal with him was to build that positional strength. But now as we approach closer to competition, we need to be pushing what he's going to be doing on competition. And we need to build momentum in that because he's about to peak. This is his last strength block. I need him to actually be accustomed to the strength, like to building neurology within the sumo deadlift without the pause, right? And that's going to be a very easy transition for him because the variation was paused. He wasn't doing like deficit sumos or something ridiculous like that. So it's okay. And then he obviously takes that specific neurology and then expresses it in the peak as an example. So when it comes to just to quickly summarize, if it's less than eight weeks, you probably want to be more specific than general. 
you know, and if it's less than four weeks, like very specific. If it's any longer than 12 weeks, you can incorporate some general training to get those benefits of general training. So volume, how should we be programming our volume in our training? Well, we if you just came off a competition and you've just peaked, you probably don't want to be pushing the volume too high, especially if it's specific and even if it's general because the tissues, we've just stressed the tissues and the joints and the surrounding connective tissues quite a lot and so potentially are prone to injury. And so if we ramp up volume, we might actually get some wear and tear in those specific areas and because we've already pre kind of injured those areas through micro tears that you don't even feel, you know, this is where potentially we get uh, tendonitis. This is potentially where we get some, you know, some pretty nasty injuries and tears. And so we, the general rule is we want to be adding volume slowly, generally, right? And so if you're 12 weeks out and you're building into a volume block, Key word there is you're building into a volume block. You're not starting with five sets of eight on squats. You might actually start with two sets of eight, right? And the next block, if it's like another volume block, you might be doing three sets of 10 week one. And you build up to four sets of 10, right? Like we want to be, like we got to get used to this kind of training. Because if we ramp up too quickly, then we just like burn out. Like we just get piled with fatigue and the injury risk goes up really high. And so let's say you're eight weeks, right? You've got one strength block left. How do you adjust your volume on a per set basis so that we get the best benefits? Well, if you've just come out of a competition, you probably don't want to be trying to super compensate because the volumes by nature are unsustainable and your body is already potentially in an injured or not ideal state. And so by pushing that super compensation effect, you are just more exposed to injury. You know, how much more exposed? It's all situation dependent, right? Like if your homie like misgrooved his opener on squat and had to go like crazy to get ready and afterwards his back was seizing up and then you somehow got through deadlifts, man, are you sure you want to compete in eight weeks? But you tell yourself, yes, brother, I want to compete in eight weeks. I got to prove to my girlfriend that I am a state champion, you know? And then turns out, your girlfriend doesn't love you anyway. Such a shame, right? So now you say, you know what, stuff, I'm going to compete for me, not for her anymore. And, you know, you go for this competition. You still probably don't want to be super compensating because the injury risk is just too high. Just so we are on the same boat, super compensation is where we... Actually, before I just give a definition, I'm going to explain something. So let's say doing one set gives you one stimulus, but gives you one fatigue, right? We can only tolerate five, like five fatigue, I'm making these numbers up, before we need to deload. So, or no, sorry, we can only tolerate five fatigue before next week, we can't perform the same amount of weight, right? So imagine that once we get to a certain level of fatigue in the system, that the following week, we can't actually increase our performance because the fatigue is higher than the stimulus. This The fatigue almost puts like a blanket over the stimulus and just smothers it, right? So we, the, when we train, it's important that we manage our fatigue so that we can continue to perform and provide stimulus and manage our fatigue and so we constantly improve our performance. Eventually, we get to a point where we need to just drop fatigue. You know, resting between sessions isn't long enough And so often we need to take like a whole week off, right? It's called a deload. And it goes by situation to situation. But generally, four to eight weeks is if we're actually training hard with appropriate volumes until we need to deload, right? That's the kind of the general general outlook on, on training itself, right? If you're actually training hard. It's typically a four to eight week accumulation, and then we deload. Well, super compensation is where we go, you know what, we're going to deload next week anyway. Let's push seven, seven sets and we overshoot the amount of fatigue by a heaps of a margin. Remember how we said we can only tolerate five? 
Well, let's put seven because next week, it doesn't matter if we perform more. We're deloading on purpose. We're pulling back our training. And so what's the benefit of that? Well, you just got an extra two stimulus, right? That's the benefit. And so after the deload, we or after we drop that new fatigue, we see this compensation of performance, which is almost like higher, right? We set a baseline higher. And so that's what super compensation is. And the, but the risk is that we're doing more total work. We're putting more total work or more total damage on the joints and connective tissues. And that's a problem. And so we have to be very mindful of that. Okay, so how should we be programming intensities? You know, this is really discussion for that eight to four week kind of, or even nine week, like weird scenario. We want to be accumulating, like if we have a competition length where we need to be doing a strength lock for five weeks, we want to be accumulating intensity slowly, right? We want to be ramping up nice and slowly because if the quicker we ramp up the the, the intensity, we can see huge volume spikes. And then obviously we run into the problem mentioned earlier where we just build up too much fatigue too quickly. And so if the longer time lengths that we have, the slower we need to actually building up our, our weight, right? Like it's okay if you have to pull back two and a half kilos this week. Next week you have five kilos anyway. You know what I mean? And so it's important that we go slow. But like if you only have like a three-week strength block, you know, you might even be able to go single at six, seven, eight, or six and a half to eight and a half. Like you can do quick accumulations in intensity because that's okay. It's only a three-week strength block. And so consider like how much do you want to progress per block and then either lengthen or shorten it depending on the situation. Okay, so right after competition, what is it that you're going to be doing? right? Like if you need to be building back into a competition, let's say building into like a strength lock because you have like an eight week uh, window or even like a four week window because you're about to do a, a peak, right? You probably want to be doing something like, depending on the situation, either like that sets of, anywhere from sets of like one to six with very little volume and very little intensity. It's almost like a deload. So think about this week as potentiating next week this is about so that next week you can do three to four sets instead of having to do two you don't want to take this week off maybe even like a good protocol is like a two by six at rpe five let's say two days after comp for a movement and then you might want to do three sets of four you know <clears throat> you, you what you can even do is you can mirror week one right Take it into the following week after competition, reduce some volumes, make some intensity adjustments, and just run that, right? Or you can even just take what you're going to deload with. And so you've taken your deload that you are going to finish your competition on and just run that before the comp, I mean before your block. That's another way as well to ensure that you are, you know, transitioning into your block the most effective way possible thank you so much for watching this video um if you enjoyed it please do subscribe if you have anything to say about this video please do comment if you dislike this video you can click the dislike button that's okay but if you liked it a thumbs up would be amazing anyways thank you so much for watching uh if you want to find out a little bit more about fit big strong you can head to our website fitbigstrong.com. It's so cool to say that because I just released it today. And if you want to get some more exclusive content, uh, which we post exclusive to the platform, head over to Instagram where you can also find the website, but you also find some very short form, very high quality content designed to educate you in 10 to 15 seconds. So if that sounds like something you're interested, head over to at fitbigstrong on Instagram and if you're also interested, head over to fitbigstrong.com.